Good morning. Everybody doing okay? Prudence. Justice. Fortitude. Temperance. Some of you may recognize those as the cardinal virtues that we can trace back to antiquity, to the likes of Aristotle and Plato. We continue to embrace them over 100 generations later. We weave them into classic tales and poetry. They've been incorporated into religious traditions. And we do so because of the inherent nobility they represent and the intrinsic value they offer us. But Aristotle and Plato, as clever as they were, and they certainly were, they were not gods, they were mortals. Probably too clever by half, but mere mortals nonetheless. So they could be brilliant. They could spend their entire lives in the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. And they could be wrong. And they were. Not, not massively wrong but just not entirely right. I think they missed one. They missed a virtue that is the dynamic force that binds together our relationships, our communities, our nations. They overlooked a virtue that is the foundation for the promises we make, the contracts we sign, even the international treaties that we negotiate. They missed the virtue of trust. Now, I'm not a philosopher, nor a poet, nor a psychologist. I did not spend my life in the pursuit of wisdom. In fact, I spent my life applying deception. That doesn't mean I'm a magician. I promise you I'm not. But I was an intelligence officer. My career was spent collecting critical intelligence, not from technology, but directly from people. That meant the recruitment of foreign agents to gather secrets or to debrief a scientist or a business person who's traveled to what we call denied areas or even behind the Iron Curtain, for those of you who might remember that era. And it also involves the interrogation of prisoners of war during wartime. And that is where my journey to this stage began with a series of interrogations I conducted over 30 years ago in Operation Desert Storm. I was a captain in the United States Air Force. I had deployed to lead a team from various services of military interrogators, our assignment was to glean as much information as we could about the Iraqi capabilities through our questioning of prisoners. I was really at home in that world. In fact, I'd like to think I was good at it. I had mastered the art of living a cover, of detecting surveillance, but I think if I was exceptional in any area within that field, it was this, my ability to reframe reality that gave me an edge in the interrogation room. I could take disparate facts and in a snap, weave this very, very convincing narrative. And that's how my change, my life-changing experience began to unfold. As a senior interrogator, several of us were assigned to interrogate the colonels and then the generals that came through our prisoner of war camp. It was our job to fashion some sort of relationship that would nudge them towards disclosing what they knew. Now, I can remember that experience as if it was yesterday, because when you go through this, souls can sort of combine like this cosmic permanence. I can remember it again as if this just happened last week, because I would sit for hours, knee to knee with these generals and colonels in a small tent huddled around a heater, because you'd be surprised just how brazenly cold a desert night can be. And as we sat with one another, we muddled our way through some fuzzy version of truth. So one evening, I had a curious experience. One of the generals, we spent time sparring. He answered some questions, deflected a few others. But then he offered me a deal. He said, I will tell you everything you want to know, but on one condition. And that condition was that the US military would drive to Baghdad, would go into the city and remove the dictator, Saddam Hussein. I did not hesitate for a minute, not for a second to give him that assurance. Because another philosophy, a philosophy from, from ancient times, Sun Tzu in the Art of War wrote that all of warfare is based on deception. And this, this was warfare. So he did tell me everything he knew, which gave an incredible advantage to our side. But as you know, we did not invade Iraq in 1991 and we did not remove Saddam Hussein then. But here's something you do not know. I did not learn this till several years after the war. 
Every one of the generals that had been captured, every one of the generals had been interrogated by people like me, every one of those generals who shared their information in exchange for false promises, each one of them was summarily executed upon their return home. And something else died then. And that was my belief in the value of deception. It launched me on a multi-decade effort to understand and develop strategies built on trust, not duplicity. And I'm not just talking about in the national security arena. I'm talking about in the fullness of the life experience. So let's fast forward from Desert Storm to just a few years ago. I was invited to support a research project that was going to specifically look at the role of trust in the conduct of interrogations. This was led by a brilliant behavioral scientist, Dr. Christian Meissner at Iowa State University with invaluable contributions from two other up and coming psychologists, Dr. Simon Olitzkiewicz and Dr. Dominic Atkinson. And that research confirmed what I had intuited for years. First of all, we found like other research, that cooperation, getting somebody's voluntary cooperation leads to information disclosure. But what we found was trust was directly correlated with that cooperation. Let me put that in different terms. Trust, not deception, is the path to cooperation. So I'm going to share with you five principles that we gleaned from that research. And I'm going to illustrate each one with a case study of interrogators from World War II to the present who demonstrated the unparalleled role of trust in resolving conflict. Let's start with the definition. Trust, according to the scientific literature, is the acceptance of a degree of vulnerability with the positive expectation about the efforts, the actions of another person. More simply, it's about risk, but it's also about hope. And principle number one captures that relationship. Trust, the primary role of trust, is to reduce uncertainty about how events will unfold. I'll give you an example. Otis Carey was a Navy lieutenant, an interrogator in the Pacific in World War II. He spoke the Japanese language fluently, but more importantly, he was fluent in the intricacies of the Japanese culture. And it was through that he was able to relate to these individuals. He was able to, with authentic confidence, remind them of the potential of post-war Japan. Now, these prisoners were operating under deep uncertainty, but as he built trust, they regained a measure of it. And they understood that in the future, to build this, cooperation was going to be built on trust. And that was the bridge to that wonderful new future. And that's the way it played out. Principle number two, trust has two faces. We often think about being trustworthy, but let us not forget that it's also about showing our willingness to trust others. Trustworthy. We like to think we're trustworthy, but how often do we think about what that means? Or even more important, what does that require of us? Because being trustworthy, being worthy of one of the most precious gifts one human being can give to another, that is a belief in your ability and willingness to do right by them. But to realize the full potential of trust, we also have to give that gift to somebody else, show a willingness to trust others. During the Vietnam War, there was an interrogator, Orrin DeForest. His responsibility was interrogating members of the Viet Cong cadre, and he took a unique approach. He tried to understand them. He wanted to understand why they chose that path and honestly what they thought about Americans. But what he was able to do is to feed, to stir their belief and trust on a, on a cognitive level, and I'll describe that in a second, but also an effective, a visceral level. He was able to keep his promise of humane treatment and also, and that humane treatment included sometimes sending these detainees to live with their interrogators under the same roof, making meals together, sleeping under the same roof without a guard. They saw that he kept his promise to do that, but they also felt that here's a man who is willing to listen to our stories in his fullness. Principle number three, we think with our heads, our minds, and we also think and trust with our with our intuition with our hearts, really. We think with our minds about trust and we feel about trust with our hearts. So I think to understand this facet of trust, it's best to maybe take a cinematic view. Let's talk about trust as a documentary and also trust 
as a mystery. As a documentary, it's a rational calculus based on facts. We look for a track record of trustworthiness. We ask, does that, does that person have the ability? Will they do that? And do they have the inter integrity? Is, can they do that? Will they do that? Ability and integrity. But we also, we also have an affective approach, as I mentioned. And that is all driven by feelings. For some reason, we know, we seem to sense, I can trust that person. And that same source tells us, I cannot trust that other person. What we found in our research is benevolence is the key driver here. When we make a trust calculation, especially at the affective, visceral level, we're deciding, does that person have an interest in helping me despite the fact that there's no reward in it for them? No reward whatsoever? I talked about Orrin DeForest. He fed and stirred that cognitive trust, and then he turned around and also fed the affective trust, it, reaching people's minds, then reaching people's hearts. Now, let's go to principle four, because this is an important one. Principle four is trust is driven by empathy. And let's understand what I mean by empathy. Let's not conflate it with Sympathy. Sympathy is, I feel sorry for you. Empathy is, I can see what you're going through. Empathy is the ability to think and feel the way somebody else does who's gone through this experience. But you can vicariously push yourself, project yourself into those circumstances. And here is an individual by the name of Sherwood Moran. He was a Marine interrogator in World War II also in the Pacific. He had lived in Japan for a number of years before the war, so he spoke Japanese with near fluent level. But what he understood that helped him most of all was by living in that culture, he understood the warrior code of Bushido. And this was something that those Japanese prisoners were struggling under because the demands of being a warrior could be overwhelming. And they'd been taught then since childhood. But he reminded them that they fought well. And as warriors, like Otis Carey did, you need to start focusing on the future, on the post-war Japan and what it can become. Remember talking about trust as uncertainty. He really helped them find certainty by what they could materially contribute to the future rather than trying to hide from it. Number five, principle number five, and that is trust must be independent of reward. If we need to separate our efforts to build trust with our effort to gain. In fact, our research showed when interrogators tried to trade trust for information, like I will keep my promise to you as long as you tell me what I need to know. That doesn't work, it's a non-starter. Trust for gain is not trust at all. So I'm, I, I tried to illustrate the four previous principles with case studies, and I'm gonna do that one more time, but this time the case study is drawn from me. More specifically, me 2.0. Because now, the work I do and the training I offer is organized around the principle of trust. One of the principles, one of the protocols I follow is whatever I say is the truth. I may not share everything I know in the moment, but whatever I do say is true. Now, my experiences in recent times come from interviewing a convicted murderer on death row to a suspected terrorist detained at Guantanamo. And in all these cases, crossing cultures, crossing ethnicities, crossing age groups, crossing educational levels, what was most effective is when they found that they could trust me. When they found they could trust me, they were more willing to share information. So I was authentic. I kept my promises. I never once tried to trade trust for information. And in many of those cases, I was able to elicit information that hadn't been revealed to others before. I am no longer in the military. I no longer wear a uniform, but I still have a mission. And it's one I want to recruit you to join me in. And that is to expand the role of trust in all areas of our life. To build trustworthy institutions that we can all come together and be willing to trust. To to embrace trust and elevate it 
to a cardinal virtue. Because I fear if we do not do that, then we'll continue to fight amongst ourselves and we'll fail in collectively building that possible future. I'm going to conclude with a thought about those generals. I'll be honest with you, they came to visit me on a regular basis over the years. Whether I was by myself at home or alone in a large room. And I wanted them to simply fade away, but no longer. I am grateful when they return to my consciousness because they are no longer ghosts reminding me of who I was. They are now my brothers. They're reminding me who I am, why I'm here, and what I have left to do. Thank you, brothers, and thank you.